Would anybody talk with me? Could anybody talk, please, just to check the sound? Yes, now we can hear you, but we could not before. Thank you very much. You can video start. Okay. Uh, but see, but just see. Uh, well, hello again. Uh, now going for the final session. Uh, thank you for uh, being here for this final session. We will have three presentations and not four as we have here at the schedule because Chiara will not be able to present her communication. So we will have Camila with adapting analysis workflows to humanitarian needs, different road network models and tools. And then we will have uh, Olya uh, understanding uh, Bastian Castle in PhD using the space pattern system for spatial analysis. And we will uh, close this session before the debate with Suzanne, uh, development impact, applying network analysis to urban uh, migration data. This um, uh, presentation is not on the abstract book because of uh, late entrance, uh, but uh, nevertheless, we would like to thank Susanna for the interest in this um, symposium and her efforts to be part of it. Thank you. And uh, um, I will start now with Camila and I will mute and thank you all. Camila, you're on. Thank you. I'll try sharing the screen. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Uh, it says "Ask disabled participant screen sharing. I'll try again. C can you hear me? Yeah, I... Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, when I try sharing the screen... Oh, okay, now I can. Good. Sorry. Okay, I think that should do the work. Share. Sorry. Okay, right, there we go. So, hi everybody, uh, it's good to see you all as a former exchange student at XT. Uh, I'm Camilla Pizzica, I hope you can hear me, you said yes. I am an architectural engineer and currently a PhD candidate at the University of Pisa and, and a research assistant at the Welsh School of Architecture. I'm going to talk about how we can adapt street network analysis workflows to humanitarian needs so as to foster evidence-based design decisions after urban disasters. This research is part of a bigger study on temporary housing by the University of Pisa in collaboration with Cardiff University. I'd like to start by showing you this chart to give you a sense of the broader context of the research and appreciate its motivations. As you can see, from the beginning of the 21st century to date, there has been an increasing number of natural hazards putting pressure on planners and decision makers worldwide. A pivotal point was 2015, when several multilateral agreements were signed, among which the Sustainable Development Agenda, the New Urban Agenda, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. The latter put an accent on the importance of preventing disasters and building back better. However, there is still a need to reconnect the building back better theory and practice through evidence-based decision-making. Although most disaster management processes tend to be data-driven, this does not necessarily mean that they are based on sound evidence. The strength of evidence of the analysis is influenced by several factors, among which how the problem is framed, the data acquisition and preparation steps, the modeling choices, 
and the outputs interpretation. It is also important to consider how the analysis workflow itself constrains actors' capacity to perform the analysis. In fact, when dealing with onset urban disasters, professionals work under extreme pressure of time and resources, and they may lack analysis skills as well. Hence, all this needs to be considered to boost deliberate design and planning choices. From past research, we know that street network analysis present affordances for disaster, disaster risk reduction, which actors working on field could exploit. These include enhancing situation assessments, refining emergency and relief plans, guiding recovery and reconstruction choices through comparative analysis of alternative scenarios. And in fact, Following a positivist reasoning, street network analysis can help disclosing cause effect and relationships in actual and proposed physical changes to urban form, including effects on natural movement patterns, as in space syntax. Um, these analysis affordances exist independently from the fact that they are actualized or not, simply because actors who could fulfill their potential for action do exist. However, it seems important to discuss how they could truly pay off. To this end, we explored how urban scale street network analysis can be streamlined. This flowchart illustrates the proposed workflows as well as the required data input software interfaces and tools. We identify the synergies between volunteered geographic information, open geocomputing platforms, and considered also two types of configurational analysis models, that is classical primal street network models and dual angular segment models. Since the latter are more diffuse among urban designers and planners, in a previous study, we specifically addressed the issue of how to rapidly extract road center line data from OpenStreetMap and suitably prepare it for the dual graph analysis. While here, we keep a parallel focus on primal and dual models and compare the semantic content of their visual outputs, because interchanging the two would not only improve computational costs in most cases, but also models interoperability and dialogue across different disciplines. So going back to the models, I just want to clarify what we are dealing with when we talk about primal and dual graphs. Beyond a common graph theory background, primal and dual models differ in the way they translate the urban grid into a graph made of nodes and connected by links. In the former case, the primal approach, streets are graph edges and crossroads are the nodes. In the latter case, that is a dual approach, street segments are the nodes and the edges represent their topological connections. Here, street segments can intersect on virtually unlimited number of other streets, which does not happen in prima graphs where the number of connections per node is constrained by the physical size of road intersections. These two models clearly have different focuses, measure distances in distinct ways, and have been used for different purposes with little, little methodological cross-fertilization. And by looking simply at the node count in two sample cities, we can see that the primal graphs consistently present less nodes than dual graphs built on road segment maps. This obviously impacts on processing time because the more the nodes, the longer the time needed to complete the analysis in a nonlinear way. And we advanced that uh, a special type of heuristics, which we might call configuration analysis heuristics, can be applied to speed up the dual angular segment analysis workflows when time and computational resources are not available by interchanging the visual outputs of primal and dual metric models. Obviously, this is not intended to replace the actual analysis, but rather to offer some guidance in contexts where which are information poor. This should reduce the systematic errors and cognitive biases of experts who make the complex choices in short time by resorting to intuition in rapidly changing unstructured decision-making environments. Some parallels can be established, in fact, between primal and dual metrics of street network centrality, both in terms of their formulation as well as of their underlying concepts. In some ways, being close, being between, and being connected to others, each represent different aspects of the umbrella term urban accessibility. 
Besides, some semantic correspondences, such as that between the two color-coded maps that you can see in this slide, suggested the idea of testing the interchangeability of their visual outputs for a rapid preliminary evaluation of the road's accessibility levels after onset urban disasters. We pilot tested this idea through a comparative analysis of the cities of L'Aquila in Italy and Cali in Colombia. These two case studies were chosen because they are both earthquake prone cities, but also very different one from another. In terms of origin, urban development process, population density and urban form. In fact, as you can see in the figure ground images, L'Aquila present a dense self-organized organic grid with narrow winding streets, whereas Cali has a planned coarse grain street network pattern. And this is what we got for the work network of Cali. The image shows an acceptable correspondence between the visual outputs of the primal and the dual global analysis, which can be highly advantageous to speed up the centrality assessment of this fairly large network system. A weaker correspondence, although arguably still acceptable, can be found in the middle column between the distribution of nine and closing centrality, possibly due to the sensitivity of the index to the edge effect. In the work network of L'Aquila, the correspondence is less evident, and this might depend on the different way nodes are distributed in gridded and organic networks by primal and dual analysis models, as well as the different ways in which the two analyses measure distances when angular change is introduced. This hypothesis was tested by adding mark points in visually strategic locations to the primal model of L'Aquila according to angular variations. And this moved uh, the primal analysis results closer to those of the angular segment analysis. Nevertheless, L'Aquila's dual graph is not huge, and thus in such a case, probably the primal analysis could rather be used uh, as a complementary information source to add information about crossroads to road segments. Now, moving from the study of L'Aquila before to L'Aquila after the 2009 earthquake, this is how this method can be used to highlight changes in levels of accessibility after an actual disaster. This requires cutting out from the grid the so-called red zone, which is the urban area made inaccessible by the rubble and the dangerous buildings after the earthquake. Here we can observe that by eliminating a big chunk of the original uh, organic urban fabric, the color-coded maps now visually correlate more closely than before. Additionally, the image highlights the deep changes to urban form caused by the disaster, which endured for long. As you can see here, to date, more than 11 years after the event, a part of the city center, uh, mainly in the Northwest, remains precluded to public use to difficulties in the reconstruction process. Within such a context, it obviously would make sense to consider also street network resilience indicators, but here formal correspondences between primal and dual metrics are not straightforward to establish. Therefore, in this study, we will only use a basic resilience index uh, that measures the average redundancy of links in an urban grid and its capacity to resist to randomly placed disruptions. This is a single number that using um, structural engineering expression accounts for the hyperstaticity of the street network system. And this chart shows the mean connectivity and average connections per node values in the two cities for the bike, drive and walk mobility networks. We can observe that Cali in red consistently performs better than L'Aquila in blue with respect to both metrics. Additionally, in both cities, the walk network results the most redundantly connected while the bike network is the least. Nevertheless, the, the absolute values are largely comparable between primal and dual models, with L'Aquila having on average two to three connections per node and Kali having three to four. This could have been expected because the dual graph analysis was performed on a segment map where streets are split according to angular variations, despite being in principle a unique entity. This also explains why the dual model of Kali, due to its regular grid structure, results more interconnected than its primal twin, whereas for L'Aquila, as you can see, it's the other way around. 
I'm concluding. So uh, to sum up, the street network analysis has a potential to support post-disaster assessments and evidence-based decision-making in disaster risk reduction planning and design efforts. But to actualize its affordances, the analysis should be streamlined so that humanitarian actors working under extreme circumstances can make the most of it. To this end, collaborative geodata and open geographic computational platforms offer an important support. And under certain circumstances, what we called configuration analysis heuristics could further contribute to speed up preliminary evaluations. This exploratory study um, basically showed that inter interchangeability of visual outputs from primal and dual analysis models could depend on configurational differences on a spectrum from organic to planned gridded uh, urban grids. However, further research is needed to establish thresholds and generalize results. Thank you. Thank you, Camila. Now we will have Olha uh, understanding Bastian Castel. Uh, I will mute myself now whenever you're ready. Can you see the screen? Yes, very good. Yeah, great. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from the sunny Porto. Uh, thank you for gathering here to see my presentation. In, in the next 15 minutes, I will show you the work that I, I have done during my fellowship in Vienna under the supervision of Professor George Sutter. And uh, what is the problematic of, of the work is um, that one of the most fun fundamental concepts that we learn in architectural design is the concept of typology. And when we think about typology, it's about the logic of types. And we might think in terms of functional typology, uh, like uh, the residential building, or is it a sacral building or a military building? And it's not wrong, but it's very, very limiting. And the castle can be converted uh, into the a hospital and the hospital can be converted into a museum. And uh, it was what happened with Pidhirce Castle. And the functional type is not wrong, but we need something more fundamental. In particular, this applies for the building with historical military significance that, uh, such as castles, because their primary function is not, re not relevant and needs something for adaptation. And in case of castles, usually architects use um, field observations for analysis and uh, uh, before the rehabilitation. However, this approach can create some limitations in our imagination regarding to the possible functions that can be used for this building. And to be able to do the interventions and ad adaptations um, to meet these new functions, we need to understand the building morphology, regardless its style and its type. And uh, to do that, we must establish some distance from usual building concerns, such as primary building function, social role, patronage, materials. Instead, we should examine the geometry and spatial relations of these structures. And how the spatial analysis can help us uh, in solving the problem? Uh, for example, we can, it can help us uh, with answering the question, what are the similarities and differences of floor plans in the historical building like castle and model, modern residential building regarding the accessibility, natural lighting, natural ventilation, orientation, and others. Uh, this study shows how to approach the pure analysis of historic buildings uh, using the theory of space introduced by Hiller and Hanson and the Volker's method of planning diagram. Uh, although the idea of spatial analysis uh, was introduced in the second half of 20th century, uh, it was not used uh, in, the, in the historical buildings uh, analysis uh, until recently, and especially for modern Bastion Castle, it's a uh, uh, first time evaluation. And when uh, the Falkers um, uh, presented his work about the medieval castle, 
uh, he used the simplified method uh, of uh, planning diagram. And this method is not uh, totally uh, simplified and totally schematic because it uses the, the shapes of dif different shapes that represent the room. And they are connected by the lines and those lines uh, represent the pedestrian circulation in, in, the, in the room. And the disadvantage of such method can be when we want to um, analyze different cases, because for, anal for analysis of different cases is better to have a unified rules uh, to, to compare them later. Uh, so uh, previously described methods can be instrumental in combination with more recent works, especially with the power of computer automatization of analysis. And uh, a few years ago, George Satter from the Technical University of Vienna developed a space pattern system to analyze the spatial structure of residential buildings. And this software is used for the case study analysis in this paper, and you can see uh, the screen of the website. It's free to use. Um, and, and namely, the analysis of Pidhir Sebastian Castle in Ukraine was uh, performed using this system. The building itself is a complicated case. It is the complex that sees the residential area embedded in the military structure. Uh, so it was the form was influenced by military development and residential development. And uh, the study consists of two main parts. The first one is the data collection, which includes the historical documentation, scale drawings, processing, and modeling. And the second one is analysis. So the modeling is done using the plugin that can be downloaded from the website for the AfterCAD. And uh, then you have the different layers, like the layer of windows, the layer of doors, unit door, partitions, walls. And you made the simplified models of the building. Actually, for before it was used for residential buildings, just residential, and there we could neglect the widths of the walls. But when I started to use for to use it for for castles, uh, because of the big widths of the walls, I could not neglect totally the the widths. Uh, so we decided that I will uh, do the build the, the shapes of the spaces and then to connect them by the shape of the door, or by the space of the door. Uh, then when the model is ready, you can upload it to the website and the website automatically generates the views. Uh, it's a heat, uh, heat map views with local and global metrics uh, that are automatically calculated. Uh, then you can see it on the map and when you do the close up view, you see the views. Actually, the system creates the heat map style visualization and you can choose which visualization you would like to see more detailed. Is it the pedestrian circulation, natural lighting, natural ventilation or others? And uh, for purpose of this study, I decided to use the natural lighting, uh, the, it's the daylight access graphs and pedestrian circulation. And uh, the result, uh, actually the pedestrian circulation view, it is a heat map set, uh, style visualization automatically generated from an input floor plan. And in this view, uh, the space access network is modeled with spaces and doors as nodes. Edges represented access relations between doors and, and spaces. And the union door is the um, as the entrance to the building and it's uh, calculated as uh, zero and uh, it has a light blue color and when we go further from the exit uh, we uh, the color becomes more red so and uh, so the outcome of uh, the analysis for pinhirti castle was that uh, uh, considering all three levels uh, we have a lot of uh, cycles which caused by enfilade planning that was the common feature of the design of this period of time and cycles are very extensive oh sorry uh, cycles are very ex extensive and um, they connect uh, four and more spaces and the main part has a centrally located staircase 
And uh, the function of the rooms in Pinhirti Castle was changing several times. And in some cases, rooms were partitioned, the doors were walled up or, or placed in other places. So it made the changes in the circulation view. And so I decided to also to model the older plan from 1956 to see these uh, changes. And as you can see, actually, they look very similar. Uh, but uh, in the close analysis, they have the difference. And the major difference in pedestrian access is the number of cycles, because uh, bef uh, before we had 21 cycles, and now we have just eight cycles. And uh, as we can see, that the most connected space is the yard, in a yard. And another view, it's a natural lighting view that represents the relation of access to the daylight, where the light zones uh, on the layout, that yellow, uh, yellow uh, rooms, it's um, where you have the direct light, the darker color, it's indirect light through the other rooms, and uh, the red color, it's when you don't have light at all. And uh, as, as a result, we can see that um, the Bastion Castle in Pinhirti has uh, high daylight access and also they have uh, multilateral spaces and uh, that connects the view with the garden and uh, with landscape around. Also that the staircase is without the light and it's also a common feature for villas in Palladio designs because when there is external stairs, the internal stairs doesn't have light. And uh, here is upper floors and also some results. Uh, as we can see that orientation, for example, we have two spaces with quadrilateral orientation and four spaces with trilateral and eight with bilateral. So it's really connected to the landscape. And this slide shows that Pidhirti Castle, same as Palladian Villas has a strong connection. Uh, with the land landscape. And in the example of Villa Godi, the authors uh, say that um, um, it has the inner space, the hall that is connected to the rear side and to, to the front side, front uh, garden and rear. And also we have the same uh, similarities with Pidhirti Castle. And uh, here is uh, the pedestrian circulation that also captured the enfilade planning, the, another characteristics of Renaissance Villa. And as in, in the Godi, the windows are located opposite the doors and uh, in the main corpus. Uh, that it was underlined by Schme uh, the researchers Schmink and uh, Niemeyer. Uh, and they say that such organization does not allow the person to hit the blind wall, uh, but leads the person towards the window, towards the view, uh, and the light penetrates from several sides. So as, as a conclusion, uh, during the fellowship, I have also modeled other seven bastion castles. And uh, as a result, you can see that uh, although it's a military function, it's a, it's a castle, it has a lot of uh, connection with the landscape and uh, well-lit spaces. Um, for example, uh, moreover, the study, uh, the study case shows that it's 80% of uh, light, direct di uh, daylight. Uh, and if we put it inside of the modern uh, buildings analysis, that here you can see 50 buildings from different, 50 residential buildings from different uh, cities in Europe. And I think not only in Europe. Um, so you can see that it's very high because it's between very high level of uh, lightning and, uh, uh, and, and high. Uh, so um, although it is a castle, we cannot think that it's not suitable for something beautiful because we can use it for different purposes uh, and we will have sa same connection with the landscape and uh, with views as it was in, for example, in Yilva's design. Uh, thank you. It, is, uh, it was my pleasure to share my research journey with you, and I will welcome any questions. Thank you. It was our pleasure to have your presentation. 
And uh, now we will go to the final uh, session, the final presentation. Uh, Susanna, when you're I ready, uh, I will mute. Okay, thank you for your presentation also. So I can't share, oh, there we go. Can you see? Yes, very good. So I just want to say thank you again for letting me present. I know I had unusual circumstances this spring that caused me to miss the, the deadline for the book, but I really appreciate your allowing me to present. Um, anyhow, um, my name is Susanna and I'm a, a PhD student in the Institute for Technology and Architecture at ETH Zurich. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I'm focusing on the impact of, of large urban development projects. I'm so sorry, sorry I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear can't hear me. We hear, but we don't see anything. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But do you see a black? Um, okay, one moment. Thank you for letting me know. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. That's All right. Good. Try to no go on with it. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank yes. you. Is, is that clear now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, I did the full screen the wrong way. Um, so uh, my project focuses on the impact of urban development projects on urban migration. And so how neighborhoods change when projects are constructed within them. Um, and so before I was a PhD researcher, I was an architect. Well, I, I'm still an architect, but I worked as an architect for a long time in, um, in the United States. And I was overseeing um, large projects like the kind I'm now studying. And what I found was that as an architect, I didn't really have access. There wasn't really knowledge about how large urban redevelopment projects were impacting the communities um, in which they were being built. So that's what led me to start doing this research to study that. And what the first thing I found was that the bulk of the literature on neighborhood change is really primarily anecdotal. And I don't mean that negatively. I think it's, that term is often used somewhat dismissively, but I really don't mean that. I just mean it's, it's the literature really is based on collections of stories or collections of personal individual narratives or narratives of specific neighborhoods um, in cities. And I think that's an incredibly important voice in the discussion and it's an incredibly important documentation of people's lived experience of neighborhood change in cities. Um, and I do also think that the data picture from this is missing, that we don't have uh, quantitative measurements of the, the sort of magnitude of change that could be happening, um, you know, at the same time. And then I think the, I suspect that there's in the data picture and the sort of individual personal narrative picture, there's a bit of a mismatch sometimes. And I think understanding that is, would be important to understanding how, how people are affected as cities grow and change. Um, so there have been some, some measurements of these. It's not sort of entirely non-existent. Um, one uh, precedent study was done at the University of Zurich. This is for Zurich specifically. Um, where Karina Chaya and Harry Lutold looked at, they sort of developed a status level indicator based on economic and socioeconomic factors. Um, and they, they sort of measured the segregation index too. But another, I think quite notorious precedent study was done by Lance Freeman at Columbia University. Um, and this is focused on New York City where he, he thought to compare um, gentrifying neighborhoods with neighborhoods of similar socioeconomic status that were not gentrifying, that were not changing rapidly um, to see whether people were being displaced at the same rate in both neighborhoods. Um, and what he found, I think quite to his surprise, as well as many other people's, was that the gentrifying neighborhoods actually had a much more stable population than the non-gentrifying ones, that people were being displaced, that the population turnover was much higher in the non-gentrifying neighborhoods, um, which really I think opened the door to say like, we actually need to look at the data picture as well here, that if we are able to measure things like displacement, which is notoriously tricky to measure, um, that gives us another angle to understand what's really going on when people feel like their neighborhood is changing and they've been completely kicked out. Um, I think sort of understanding the data picture adds a, a new dimension to those kinds of stories. Um, so my method is a combined approach. It's using the perceptive, method of, of interviews and surveys 
um, as well as the mapping and indicator analysis, like in the previous slide. Um, but also I'm using graph theory, the tools of graph theory to understand neighborhood buildings as a network connected by, or as a graph connected by people moving back and forth between them as a way to really put a quantitative measurement aspect on how the buildings themselves as they're constructed or change are affecting how people move in and out of different areas of the city. Um, so the data that I'm using comes from the Swiss register survey. Um, Switzerland stopped doing a census every 10 years starting in 2010, but instead has this uh, individual data set that they take every year. They take a snapshot every year of the entire population. So um, it's an incredibly rich data set. So it's every person in Switzerland with an enormous amount of data about them, their year of birth, their nationality, their where they were born, their marital status, where they live, what their job is, um, health stuff, type of residence permanent. I mean, it's like their religion, I mean, any number of different um, aspects um, that are um, quite quite telling when taken in, in aggregate, I think. And it's for every person. So it's one that it's taken every year. So the fine grain of the data is, is really quite striking. Um, and so the first thing that I am using this data for is to um, define the scope of the study that defining boundaries of a city or a city region is also a notoriously tricky problem. And the, the Zurich, um, Agglomeration is the preferred Swiss English word um, for the, the sort of metropolitan region it has been defined a number of different ways by the federal statistics office. Um, there's one based on sort of urban character, like core cities and commuter belts. There's one based on population defined as residents, commuters and visitors. There's another definition based on population and another one based on density. Um, but I, so for this research, I'm, I created my own <laughs> definition, again, using graph theory. So I created a graph where every, every vertex is um, a municipality. And then every, the edges between them are the people moving back and forth between these municipalities, because what I'm studying is the patterns of people moving back and forth. So um, then taking this graph, I ran a number of different clustering algorithms on it to try to determine communities within Switzerland. Um, that made where they had the highest density of people moving back and forth between different municipalities. So the results here um, is a map of Switzerland and the dark blue area is what I would call the Zurich cluster that's sort of centered on the core city of Zurich. Um, you can see the Zurich Sea right here, um, which is much broader. It's a much broader definition than any of the sort of official metropolitan area of Zurich definitions. But to me, it makes a lot more sense because it, it sort of captures the gravitational pull. The Zurich is the biggest city and it captures the gravitational pull of the biggest city, um, indicating the, the range of places throughout the country where people are moving back and forth um, into and out of the Zurich, the Zurich area. Um, so within that area, I've looked at a number of different factors at the regional scale. One is a, a gentrification factor against sort of how much a neighborhood was changing or a municipality was changing in its um, sort of economic status and education level, so professional status and education level, how much it was changing, increasing or decreasing relative to the increase or decrease of the overall region. Um, and you can see in this that that's pretty centered in the core city, has a sort of highest level of gentrification, which is not too surprising. Um, and I also looked at a displacement index, which um, I think displacement has been theorized in a number of different ways. It has a lot to do with a sense of belonging, an idea that maybe public space no longer belongs to you. You've seen your friends move away. And I'm not, um, I'm not trying to, I guess, deny that literature on the subject. What I'm doing here is taking an intentionally naive, purely quantitative measure of saying, you know, one person moves in, one person moves out. That's a pair. That's one person who is literally taking the place of another person um, in a municipality. So that's again using the, the graph that I made. So it's, it's the in degree, the sort of difference between in degree and out degree um, taken over, divided over the total population to get this displacement index. Um, and here you can see that it's actually happening the least in the densest areas. This light yellow areas are Winterthur and Zurich and Luzern. And those are the, the densest core cities. And then it's actually increases as you head out into the more rural areas in how I'm defining the agglomeration. Um, and finally, something I correlated both of these indicators with uh, construction of new apartments. So like new, new um, residential construction. 
per, um, per thousand people in each of these areas. And I found that correlation to be sort of spot on zero. Like they really do not correlate at all. Either like new construction really does not correlate with displacement nor gentrification in either case, which is quite surprising given the literature that this um, uh, takes new construction as a, as a catalyst for gentrification often um, within Zurich and within the greater global context as well. So that said, the regional scale can only take you so far. This um, you know, this core city is a quite a big diverse area and often this displacement happens at a much more fine grained scale. It happens in a neighborhood or by street or by building even. Um, so the next phase of the research, this is <laughs> a bit dangerous to so research that's currently in progress. So I don't know what the outcome is going to be of this yet, but um, takes the core city of Zurich. And then within it, there's these um, areas divided into further quarters. So this is one you can see on the map, it's somewhat isolated. There's a river along one side and railroad tracks on the other. Um, so it's one Kreis, it's one city area divided into two quarters, Escherwies and Gewerbschule. And Escherwies has a very high level of new construction over the past 10 years, whereas Gewerbschule has a very low one. And you can see that in the color coding, the darker blues are just the newer buildings. Um, so I'm taking these two neighborhoods as a comparison study, essentially, to say like how in a neighborhood with a lot of new construction and a neighborhood with very little, um, how do the rates of population turnover, displacement, gentrification compare? And I'm doing this with other pairs of neighborhoods in the city as well. But for right now, I talk about these two. Um, and finally, the way I'm doing this is again using using a graph. So in these graphs, every vertex is a building and the every edge between them is a person moving from one building to the next. So it's what I was doing at the regional level, but at a much more finely grained scale. And you can see on the left, this is just one. These are all the buildings in Escherwies and are the blue and the orange is where people moved from into the neighborhood. Um, and then on the right, you can also from the data set that I have, find out where the people moved out of the neighborhood and where they went, which is one of the hardest things to measure about displacement is once the people have been displaced, they're gone. So you can't always find them again. But with this um, somewhat obsessive data set that the Swiss have, you can actually find them again. So that's what I'm showing in the, the graph on the right is both people moving into the neighborhood and people moving out of the neighborhood. And I can I'm able to tell where they came from and where they went. And then I can do this year after year after year and also scale this up to a larger area of the city or down to just a couple of buildings on one street, um, depending on where the analysis leads. But you can see how using the tools of graph theory gives me sort of a really fine grained way of measuring exactly how certain buildings are impacting the flow of people throughout the neighborhood. Um, so I will leave it there and thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you all. It was very good to have this set of three presentations. Very interesting, with very interesting approaches. Um, I would like to ask uh, for questions uh, here in the room or online. Yes, the, David. Yeah. yeah, please come here and uh, so you can be listening. I would like to, to ask some questions. Lava, please. Yeah, I would like to ask some questions to the producer author Dan, Dan Susana. I, I don't know if you, the, the one with the castle. I, I didn't retain the, the name, sorry. Um, uh, first of all. Oh, yeah. All, oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for your presentation and your research. That was very, very interesting, at least for me because uh, I'm working in, we are working in, in, in things uh, very near to, to that. And you said that you use the AutoCAD to make uh, the modeling. My first question is why AutoCAD? Uh, that doesn't seem the, um, uh, the best program for that. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, why do you use the thickness? Uh, because uh, maybe you can do the same without the thickness. I don't know if the interiors are aware of the exteriors or it's just a cave, just the interior that is analyzed. Um, thirdly, I, I would like to, to ask if you, if you and your colleagues have an um, import or export from 
um, a beam because uh, this is very related to, to that. In fact, we are trying to to deal with these issues. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to contact you uh, in order to maybe we can collaborate or, or something. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, why AfterCut? It's actually because uh, it's, uh, it's a long project that was done by Professor George, Sta uh, George Sutter and he started with AfterCut and he made the plugin for AfterCut. That's why it's AfterCut. And then when I uh, arrived, because I was trying to find the person who is dealing with space syntax and I found his work and I decided to work with him. I applied for the scholarship there and I went to the fellowship uh, to Austria. And uh, then when I arrived, so I just started to, to use the program and to uh, it was firstly developed just to residential buildings. And uh, the idea was to, to make it useful for historical buildings too. And uh, so we are moving a bit for the question about the thickness. Um, why the thickness? Mm, yeah, of course, for the spatial analysis, just for, for example, for light and for pedestrian circul circulation, the thickness doesn't matter. But uh, the program stores uh, the, um, the width and the length of the, uh, like all the parameters of the room, and uh, my idea was later to use it for typological analysis and analysis of spaces in terms of uh, proportional analysis of spaces. That's why I needed actually the, the actual lengths and widths. It was like an idea for future to, to make something more uh, from that. And uh, yeah, for example, we can use this uh, for, uh, for finding the location roads and then we need the actual length because if to if to think about just for the graphs of course we don't need the real real sizes we can just use the the, the proportions of, of the rooms but if you want to do something more with that you need the real size yeah but the, the model is quite interesting i'm, I'm sure that with being that will be an interesting connection from export, uh, import, export. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's in, in the way, I, and I think that it's difficult to 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 make the compatibility and the um, uh, yeah to the compatibility between programs. That's it. Yes. Thank you. One. Thank question. you. Uh, I can. I have two. Uh, one comment and two questions, maybe. Uh, one for sure, the other one, I'm thinking about it. Uh, first comment, I, I really enjoy the efforts in presentation one and presentation three regarding uh, the uh, correlation between qualitative and quantitative approaches. Um, and I think it's uh, something that uh, um, uh, we also have as a, uh, an issue on our radar on this symposium. And uh, uh, regarding this um, uh, approach between qualitative and quantitative um, methods, um, I would like to ask to Susanna, I, I understood the, the, the relation that you established between quantification and connective. Uh, but I would like to ask you to go a little bit more on the issue concerning perceptive or perception, if you want, because uh, during what you sh uh, show concerning your analysis, um, I wasn't, um, it wasn't clear for me where the perception um, part of the approach enter and connects to the previous ones that you mentioned. And I think that um, uh, this question about perception is, is really very interesting. It's also an issue that I work on my research and try to merge it with uh, quantitative approaches also. So uh, if you could go a little bit more on this um, articulation between the perception and the, um, the previous um, steps that you um, uh, mentioned uh, when um, presenting your uh, research. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I think partly I didn't talk about it because I haven't I haven't done that part of the research yet. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but basically, the idea is that as I use the graphs to ascertain which buildings are playing key roles as sort of gateways for moving people through and sort of how they're impacting, as well as understanding sort of where the bulk of the people who are leaving are going, um, I'm going to implement a survey in a select um, group of buildings, basically that emerge as kind of key actors in this graph. Um, and then once I implement that survey, that will both address, um, try to create another graph of personal connections to sort of assess whether people's network or community really is geographically based or whether it sort of expands into the city, as well as a bunch of perceptive questions or sort of how did, you know, why, why, what your, were your reasons for moving? Like what, you know, what was your sense of, oh, I haven't written the questions yet, but that's the goal is to really um, zero in on key buildings where there's been a lot of change and turn and find the people who have left or moved or had um, some disruption because of new construction and then get a lot more information from them about um, their perceptions of what was happening as well. Does that uh, answer your question? Because yeah, I do think it's really, it's critical and to have that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so also because sometimes perception is a, is a mental construction of a phenomenon if you want. So uh, my interest is in merging with, uh, perception with the quantitative approaches is precisely to understand how constructed is that perception. If yeah. it is really a perception or is more a, a, a constructed idea of, of a certain problem, of a certain phenomenon or whatever. So this is something that I, I think it's really interesting to explore by combining, by uh, correlating these um, formal methods, this quanti quantitative approach, if you want, and then a qualitative approach to the same problem and try to understand where do they uh, meet each other, where, do, where is the, the connecting point between one and, and the other. So I find it interesting and I hope uh, in two years now you will be presenting the yes, me too. <laughs> of the research on the next symposium because that would be really interesting to understand. Um, that part of your research too. Uh, the other question for the, for the first um, uh, presentation, it's also about this very interesting relation that you established between this uh, kind of empirical way of doing um, um, space index, if you want, and um, uh, the way you established this uh, relation with syntactical an analysis. So Camila, if you can go a little bit more on this, um, because I understood when you put the maps side by side and you, you, you say this is this, this is this, and this is that. Okay, this is that, that was clear, but the previous step, uh, I would like you to go a little bit more uh, regarding the previous step. How do you um, make this um, uh, correlation, if you want? If you, how, how do you establish these this links between uh, one another? Uh, so the, the correlation wasn't done formally, say there was no um, mathematical process behind it, but it was more established in terms of what's the, the meaning they convey, what, what they can suggest to the planner or to the designer that can be useful for them. Because ultimately, um, it's also, um, if you want, a way to put into question the, the model as a as the real truth, you know, because in the end, uh, it kind of triggers the the fact that you have to have critical thinking about what you're looking at and is what you want out of it that counts more than anything else. And you're trying, it's kind of tries to reverse uh, the position as kind of you, you get into control of the tools and you just want, uh, and then you decide what you want out of it really. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the idea is um, potentially there are lots of information that could be useful to a person who decides under extreme circumstances. And most of the decisions are done uh, based on experience and that doesn't work. Uh, so it's putting things on paper and putting it there so that you can discuss it with others so that then you can track the process. I think that's the real value of this really more than uh, having a number which is certain. So I guess the, the qualitative aspect of it is important because it brings on the table these 
uh, this important point, which is there is no unique way of making this decision nor like of modeling the situation, but still having like a first point, a first common point of discussion is important to kind of progress uh, the discussion about possible planning and design choices. And then try again and again and see what are uh, the response like uh, to the variations that you get um, from your model, and then you can go ahead. So basically, it's using this as a means to an end to guide a process that is more evidence based than it was before. I, I can understand that, but the, the question is about uh, a simple something simple as this. If I okay. took your methodology and I applied to uh, the same state because you know, the same um, uh, city you study or the same problem you study and or a different one, would I have the same results? Because if it is uh, something that it's empirical or it's from my experience, the calibration that I, I can give to the, the to the correlation that you establish it is not uh, something that it's quite uh, fixed or it's quite uh, straight. So there's a, a kind of um, uh, ambiguity in this step. Is that correct? Is, 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 is this how yeah. you... I only took two examples that were opposite, like one gridded structure and one organic, but you would need plenty more to generalize the results. You would also probably need to do some correlations and then find a threshold between which you can move. So okay. at the moment that wasn't done, this was kind of an explorative um, okay. test. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if I do it, I, I will let you know when you start to build up your uh, correlations layers in order to get that um, more focus uh, uh, relation between. Thank you. Some more questions? Between the, the room, there's no more questions. You have more questions? No? So I guess we can close this session. I really Everyone is tired, you. probably. I really thank you for being here with us so late and uh, to um, stay with us. And uh, now I think we can close the symposium. I would like to call Franklin. And I would like to call Sara here with me, please, just to say goodbye and to have you um, have some uh, sit here, please, Franklin. And um, just some words about uh, the book, Sarah, probably, uh, if you want to make a little update regarding the book. And um, here we are all. I don't know if you can see us all. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't okay. think so. Okay, something like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will um, ask Sarah to say some words, some final remarks, mm -hmm. and then I will thank you, Sarah. Role. Okay. And then I will thank you, Franklin, but uh, Sarah, be my guest. Okay, thank you. So, oh, sorry. Very... <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, we are all tired <laughs> yeah. and we were with masks. So. Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, thank you all for, for, for coming to ICTE. Well, the people at least that are here and you are here in virtual way. So it was, it was great. It was, it was a big challenge this yeah. time to organize this. Um, I think that all of you received the, the, the chapter by Springer um, two weeks ago, something like that. You must have received the, the proof of the chapter to, to check if everything was correct. Uh, I received all of them. So, so I, I, I double checked if you also have them. Um, they, they are they are working on the topic so I believe that until the end of the year the book will be published it is already uh, online to be pre-ordered so it's not still available but it's it's pre-orderable so it's still not online the, the the table of contents um yeah but I think it will be soon and then everyone can can have a, a copy of it <laughs> okay okay great it was well, a pleasure frankly. and also thank them for allowing this year for formal methods to be in the I mean, I was expecting a much, much bigger party, but okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll party next time. Yeah, we'll party next time. Absolutely. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Um, really great conference. And uh, I think uh, it goes without saying thank you again for organizing and all the stops and breaks that happened. I just wanted to mention it again. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thanks. For your uh, Thank you. in the sixth symposium in, the sixth. in 2022. <laughs> we don't know already. We have not decided already where it will take place, but uh, feel free to participate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's what I have to, to say. Well, well, hopefully, not in a social VR. Um, platform as, yes. as our last presenter today. These last slides, everyone in this social VR. I mean, yeah, it's okay for something, but I hope that we can do it live. Yeah. VR parties are not uh, <laughs> something that it's in the book. Um, I would like to thank Franklin, George, and especially to Sarah, your um, contribution to this edition. Uh, it was great. I hope uh, the COVID thing wasn't here so that this could be even greater, mm -hmm. but it is uh, still a very good thing to celebrate. So- And, and uh, someone, so, so to and, share. Yeah, yeah. And Maria Joao also, now we have to all fit in the screen. So yeah. <laughs> Maria Joao is also here. Maria Joao is- She was very important during all the process. She is amazing <laughs> at sharing that all this uh, online thing goes perfectly. And um, and uh, we have to uh, thank you all and wish you uh, all good and see you in 22, 2022. So mm -hmm. we'll be in touch. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Shpe. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Thank <laughs> you, Franklin. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I will mute now. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I will mute myself <laughs> without a mask. Bye-bye. <laughs>